Thank you so much, Nicole. And welcome everybody. We're gonna start in gallery view just because it's a wonderful way to start out always when you're on an online setting. If you have your camera, go ahead and turn it on because you're gonna be working with your colleagues a couple of times during our session together. So it's good to just check and make sure your camera works. Um, I'm looking at the poll right now. We have about 70% uh, participation. Uh, we're not doing screen sharing. We're just doing the, your, uh, so Sharma, we're gonna ask you not to screen share but you're turning on your camera, which is different than screen sharing. So this is why it's a great thing to check things out. <sighs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share what the poll has to say, but notice there are three questions. So make sure you scroll all the way down or it won't let you submit. So it's great to see your faces. Look up and down, let's play Brady Bunch. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> and I am gonna ask you to choose one sentence to complete in the chat and I'm going to put it in the chat right now but I'll say it to you as well. So you can you can complete the sentence I love to write because dot 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 so you can complete that sentence in the chat or you can complete the sentence teaching writing is. So if you would take a moment and uh, go ahead and complete the poll and once you complete the poll complete the sentence. And Catherine, I need you to use the sentence because I don't know whether you love to write because it's cathartic or teaching writing is cathartic. <laughs> so give me, I don't mean to be so, so much of a stickler, but give me the sentence. <laughs> it's good to see you, Kathy. I do feel a little bit like Miss Mary that I can see Marsha, I can see Claire. <laughs> and Marissa, even though I can't see you, I know you're there. Hello, Greg. Yes, thank you for noting that. I just, uh, my computer is old, doesn't have a camera. No worries. That's why we use the chat because we want equal access. So we wanna make sure that people who don't have cameras and don't have microphones or maybe aren't in a position to use them. Um, look at what uh, Jean or Jean had to say. I love to write because writing is amazing. I love to write about my family, especially my wacky grandmother. That's a wonderful, I'd love to hear about your wacky grandmother. Naomi wrote quite a bit in my capacity as an ESOL teacher. I love teaching writing because it makes great speakers. As a published author, I love writing because in words, I am my most authentic self. And I think that is something to think about for our learners as well, right? Notice that I am reading, which is publishing your work. So you're writing it there, which is some level of publishing, but not everybody is necessarily seeing them. So I'm going ahead and publishing them further. Teaching writing is exhilarating. And uh, let's see, teaching writing is more fun to me than writing. Uh, Rebecca wrote privately, I love to write because it helps me organize my thoughts. So Rebecca, you want to put yourself on everyone so you can write with everyone. Assisted when those of us with hearing loss can read the captions. Exactly, exactly. Teaching writing gives the students the opportunity to express their feelings. I love to write because it can make my thoughts and feelings a sense of permanency. And then notice you're giving each other feedback now. So Todd's telling Jamie that he, he, he agrees, not disagrees, sorry. And Rosalind says teaching writing is a challenge. Students are at various levels because I have a combination of five, six and ECCR. And that's certainly true. But one of the great things about teaching writing is that write, learners can write to their level. So the topics are not level or uh, proficiency specific. The topics go across levels, but the level of writing can be appropriate for the student. So that's a, a great opportunity. Okay, let me go ahead and end the poll. We got about a 75% result. So let's take a look at what our results are. So uh, Kathy, can I call on you because, you know, St. John, so because I think we might have a couple of other Kathys. Um, what, what can you say about that first uh, set of data? What would you be able to say about us? And you'll need to unmute. Yes, well, I think that we are mostly classroom teachers and tutors. So we're teaching writing, I think. <laughs> okay. There's a good variety here. Exactly. There's a really good variety. And, and if we're looking at data in the classroom uh, from a survey, we could have the students do a quick write to summarize the data that they see here. So... Most of us are, 
you know, and a, and a line. So we, we can pull writing in in all different ways. How about number two? Uh, Rebecca, can I ask you to go uh, on mic and tell me what you see about number two? I'm picking on people I know, which is really <laughs> mean. <laughs> and you're speaking of the classroom teacher bar, right? Uh, I'm, uh, with whom are you working, number oh. two? I see. All right. Ooh, I'm glad that I'm joining this uh, uh, webinar because I deal mostly with ESOL uh, teacher uh, learners, and I think I have lots to learn. Oh, that's wonderful. So from on that basis, because we're 84 um, percent working with ESOL learners, but I want to tell you from the standpoint of the facilitator of this session, this is really important information for me because although the web shop, as I call it, is titled for ESOL. Notice that we have adult secondary, adult basic education, and HSC GED. So when I can, I will make that uh, transfer of information. But if I don't, I want you to keep in the back of your mind, those of you that are not uh, in an ESOL classroom or working with ESOL learners, that writing is still writing. And the writing process that we're working on is applicable across contexts. And last but not least, let's take a look at how we're all teaching. So we are in thirds, pretty much. That's the, the level of my math. Um, we're 100%, a third of us are 100%, a third of us are blended, and a third of us are in person. So that could be people are working in two different, it's a single choice. So I didn't give you an option to say maybe you're working in two different environments. But that lets me know that it's important that I put in some bonus slides for those of you that are teaching virtually. When you get the slide deck, look at the last few slides because those are tips for teaching writing on Zoom. Um, I did not make that a focus of our work together because that wasn't in the description and I didn't want to mess us up, but I kept those in there. So our work together is on doing the right thing, writing strategy instruction for ESOL learners. And again, we'll work in all adult learners because all adults need to write. And along those lines, I'd like you to think in terms of what you should be able to do as adults by the end of our workshop. So my hope is that you'll be able to engage your learners in pre-writing activities to organize and plan their written work. And the pre-writing is really important. It's not like the warm-up stage of the lesson where we sometimes go on and on and on, and we really shouldn't. We should get to the meat of the lesson. Pre-writing is where we teach a lot of strategies and we, we model a lot of things. So it's very important that this takes um, a good portion of our time together today. And then I would also hope that you'd be able to use models, frames, and checklists to provide direct instruction and writing strategies. So how do we help a learner have that agentic experience with writing that they look at a checklist and they look at their text and they say, okay, I see I have this, I need this, how do I get that? Um, and so that's where the writing strategies come in there. And then last but not least, to provide learners with templates for feedback and self-editing. Would you put in the chat the number of students you work with at one time, approximately? So go ahead and just give me an idea. Are you working with one? Are you working with five? Are you working with a class? You could just put a class. Okay, and I just want you to pop that in the chat for me. So in looking at the chat right now, I see that some are one-to-one, -one, but a goodly number of you are teaching with more than one student. And Right. And of course, if you're not in the classroom, you can think in terms of working with teachers, you know, how many teachers do you work with at a time. So if you're tutoring, this is, I just want to put this out here. Number three, if you're tutoring, you are in fact very often the feedback for your learner on that writing. If there's any way at all in your library setting or in your Zoom for you to pair up with another tutor and get your learners to be able to exchange their reading or their text with each other, this is a really good opportunity for another pair of eyes other than yours. Because sometimes what happens when the tutor is reading is that, of course, there's a hierarchy. 
we hope there isn't. We hope that we're on a you know equal level with our learners, but the learner may put you on a hierarchy. And what we want is really peer feedback. So just think about that moving forward. So I'd like to ask you to reflect. Just take about 30 seconds. What type of writing do you do? I could sing to you right now, but I'm not going to do that. Just think. And now how about your learners? So do you see any difference when you reflect on what you write versus what your learners write? It's really very important that when we're teaching writing, we have a relevant connection to what our learners need to write. Um, and that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to write whatever they want to, um, and they may feel themselves limited. It would be really good for you to find out whether your learners write poetry in their own language. A lot of times my learners wrote poetry, but unless I asked, I never found out. So learners may not see themselves as writers because they don't see books that are written by people that look like them. But the more we can bring in to show our learners, you know, the, hold up the mirror, you're a writer, the more we can um, we can inspire more writing because it's the same thing with reading. The more reading you do, the more reading you'll do. The more writing you do, the more writing you'll do. So you wanna, wanna really inspire that love of writing. And the way that we work with writing, in some cases, when we want our learners to communicate their stories is the writing process. Now, we can write in the classroom, just like what I suggested to you with the data. You know, we can write a, a sentence about the data. We can summarize a conversation. We can put, bring writing in all the time. Workbooks have writing, but they're not really writing. Right, that's they're practicing a grammar point, or they're they're working on vocabulary. We want to really get to the meat of writing, and we can't do it usually in one lesson. It often takes a. a, a you need to go outside. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Mitzi's dog would like to go outside. <laughs> let's write the story. Okay, so that's I mean that's a great opportunity in a classroom. You know, let's do a language experience story about what we just experienced, but in terms of really getting learners to write their stories or write about what's important for them, we wanna make use of the writing process if possible. And I'm just gonna give you a brief overview. Actually, before I do that, why don't I do a little bit of an assessment? Would you please rate your familiarity with the writing process? So what's interesting is that the answers with that said very familiar, those answers came up first. And the answers that are not as sure. So I've got about half of you participating. If I could get a, uh, at least 75%, I'll stop the poll. So based on what I'm seeing with our poll questions, it looks like we have a majority of people who are in this session that are really familiar with it, very too familiar. So I've got 74% uh, that are saying they're very familiar or familiar, and 26% are somewhat familiar, and no one has indicated that they're not familiar. So what that means is that this presentation is really gonna be about refining your understanding of it, and possibly having some questions about what I have to say compared to what you know. So let's see where we go with that. Quick share, just so you know I wasn't lying. So you'll notice that on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, uh, the pre-writing section is larger. 
And that's because that's the time that learners are gathering ideas, learning about the writing product and organizing their ideas or planning. And when I talked about the fact that this does, does take a substantial amount of time, some of that is about learning about the product that they're going to write. So if they're going to be uh, writing an email, then they have to look at how that's set up. Or if they're going to be writing something that compares and contrasts, they have to look at examples of that and really look at models that they can then use. When you get to the drafting stage, that's when everything, the, the, the rubber meets the road and they really have to write. And for a lot of us who are writers, um, we, you know, in a, a professional sense, um, we know that sometimes staring at that blank page is very overwhelming. So we want to make a transition between the pre-writing and the, and the writing or the pre-writing and the drafting so that students feel a little less uh, anxious or frustrated in the process. Now with the feedback and revision cycle, we want to make sure that learners are understanding that as writers, they're confirming that their ideas are get, coming across. That's really what's going on at feedback and revision. And then they're repairing breakdowns in communication. Do you see any um, relevance or, um, I don't know what, what I wanna say, do you see anything similar in this to another skill that we teach learners? What would you put on the, on the other side of writing? So Mary, with that's that's possible, but I tend to put reading and listening balance each other out because the skills that we use with reading are very much the skills that we use with listening. Mm -hmm. And writing is productive and speaking is productive. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking, we are gonna uh, we're gonna revise. Uh, if we see that our message isn't coming across, that's a natural part of a good conversation or a speech. <laughs> you know, if I'm talking to you right now and I'm getting feedback that you're not understanding what it is I'm saying, I'm going to rephrase. I'm mm -hmm. going to get more specific. So if we think in terms of the speaking skills and strategies that we teach, having some relationship to the writing skills and strategies, that's something our learners can make sense of as well because revising is a pain in the neck. Um, you know, the drafting has its own agony, but <laughs> you know, when you're being asked again and again, go back, go back. And that's really what we want to do. That's where the reading strategy comes in, where we go back in and we close read and we close read and we close read. With writing and revising and uh, revising and getting feedback, that's kind of happening as well. And now when we get to the place where we've got a revised piece of work, that's when we're gonna look at the issues with grammar, word choice, and punctuation. So if the grammar is standing in the way of the communication, then it will get repaired in the feedback and revision cycle. But if the grammar is, if the student's grammar is comprehensible, the, 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 converse, the, uh, the sentence makes sense even without the perfect grammar, we're not gonna address it at that point. Word choice, the same thing. If the student uses the word people three times and you want them to say something that's more specific, first get the story or the content and the communication straight, then have, have the student work on word choice. And to some degree, punctuation as well. Obviously, punctuation is gonna make a difference in comprehensibility. So we might help the learner with punctuation during the revision stage, but it's really at editing that we're gonna work on that. And then we come to copy editing and formatting. So that's when we're getting ready to produce this in a published form. And that's when we make the work public. So you can see that this process isn't your writing, your writing lesson every day. Mm -hmm. This is a, an intense, complex process that results in a product that the student wants to make public. So I'm gonna put you in breakout groups now, and I'm gonna ask you, what did you notice? What did you wonder about the stages of the writing process as I presented them? And please feel free to bring in your own experience, but um, keep in mind that you have four colleagues that also might wanna say something. Uh, and you have five minutes in which to have this conversation. 
So Nicole is going to put you into the breakout room. I'm going to send this slide in for just a minute so that you can remember what it is you're supposed to do. And then I'm going to stop sharing the slide and you'll see each other's faces. If you don't have a camera, not a problem. Still use your microphone. If you don't have a microphone, use the chat to connect. What questions do you have for me about your task? The power of wait time. Okay, Nicole, if you would put everybody in their breakout rooms. All right, so I'll open the, break, uh, the breakout rooms now and it should allow you to join um, a room um, that's been automatically assigned to you. So we have a few people that haven't joined. Let's see what's what. Yeah. So Ali and Vanya and Daisy and Mary, do you want to talk about it in the main room? You can open up your mic so we can talk about it together. Uh, we have a new person in two, Janice Nestor. Okay. Hi Janice, we are actually doing breakouts right now. So I will assign you to a room. Let's see. About room nine. Okay, I'm going to stop the share for the moment. And I'll pop into a breakout room. Julio, do you want to join the room? Okay, Nicole, I'm not sure. I'm going to pause the recording. Conversation. In that conversation that you had, some questions came up or maybe uh, some, some things you noticed. At the end of the session, we're going to have a, a, an amount of time. I won't name how much, but we're going to have an amount of time. If those wonderings and those noticings are still with you, that we'll address. But make a point right now so that you recall, I'm a woman of a certain age. If I don't write it down, it's gone. So if that's something that you would like to make sure gets addressed, uh, go ahead and make a little note for yourself and let's see if it does. And if it doesn't, we'll address it. So let's start by looking at the types of things we can do in pre-writing. And I'm sure you already have all kinds of things you do based on this um, poll where you all, so many of you said that you were very, um, fam very familiar and familiar, and even the somewhat familiar, because this is uh, this is where we live in the pre-writing world. This activity that you see right here, the what's on your heart, is one of my very favorite activities because it allows students to both process mentally what is important to them, but also get involved with the visual and the kinesthetic at the same time. So I could have you draw a, the shape of a heart on your paper and then write all the things that are in your heart right now. I have a good friend and every Saturday we get together, especially during you know the throes of the pandemic, and we would say, what's on your heart? As opposed to what's in your heart, because this is all the things that you hold on your heart. And one of the things that we can talk about as a part of this is that we can hold a lot of different things at the same time. 
So we can have some real deep sorrow and we can also have some real elevating joy at the same time. And that's something that students appreciate as adults being able to talk about. Now you can use a jam board for this activity. Those of you that are working virtually, or even if you're just at, in your classes and your learners have smartphones, you can put a heart shape on a jam board and have learners pop sticky notes to say what's on their heart. Um, I will put an example of that in our resources. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to give you that link for the resources right now. So in the chat, uh, this is a link to a Google Drive folder that has the resources, has the links to these slides, and has the links to the bonus slides I was telling you about. The other thing that we're going to do at this stage is learn about the writing product and organize the ideas and plan. In the process of doing that, these are the strategies that we're working on very specifically that relate to writing. A good writer visualizes. A good writer can brainstorm effectively. That means you don't throw out ideas the minute you write it down. And by throw out, I mean cross out. You do throw ideas. But the idea of being able to accept everything that you put out initially and then go back and, and refine. Um, to be able to formulate questions. What do I want to know? What do people want to know about me or about the topic? Um, to be able to work from a model, to be able to sequence and rank, to be able to use graphic organizers. Now you'll notice throughout that there are links in the slides. So when you get the slides, you'll be able to go to the different elements, but in the resources, that link is going to the graphic organizers uh, collection that I did from the Oxford Picture Dictionary. It's a freebie, so I'm allowed to put it up there. So you'll have uh, all kinds of graphic organizers and examples of how to make use of them, especially at low level ESL. Uh, and then, we want to think about, you know, what does what does it mean for our learners to get explicit instruction in these strategies? Well, the only way you can do that is if you do activities that build those strategies. So you want to conduct a brainstorm. You want to have learners use the graphic organizers. Let's take a look, for example, uh, uh, all the topics that we're going to be using I say we because I got very, very uh, collaborative there, but all the topics that the Florida Literacy Coalition is using in their new uh, collection of adult essays. So if you look at these topics, the first thing that I would have my learners do is make sure that they understand what these words are. And I would probably use a lot of visuals, but to have them rank which topics were most important to them. And if I'm in the classroom, Gosh, I can't wait till that's a reality around here. But, you know, I'd have them go to the corners in the classroom with the signs of the topics that are most interesting and have them generate a list of questions that they could ask about this particular topic. So there's a lot that you can do just on the basis of what the essay book is, is asking. And we're going to talk about the essay book again. I really, really, really like using mentor texts. And I think that they are the probably the best way to help a learner right from the start understand what you're expecting of them. So if you don't know about the change agent, the change agent is a wonderful, wonderful resource for writing and examples of student writing. Uh, this is a particular story and I'm gonna ask, Greg, do you mind turning um, on your mic and telling the story, reading the story aloud? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, I am from Haiti. In my home country, I was a nurse. I took care of babies and children. Some of them were very sick. Their families were poor. They did not have enough food to eat. We gave them food and took care of them. When COVID came, we worked many hours each day. We did not get paid. We could not leave the children. They needed us. I had to find someone to take care of my children. Now I live in the US. I study English. 
thank you very much. And I will give you a, um, a reaction of applause. If you have the reaction button, please give Greg some applause for that lovely reading. And all right, so I've uh, the students are going to tell their story. I hope you can see all that applause you got, Greg. Um, the students are going to tell their story, but I, I want them to understand how this is organized. So I use highlighting to, with the students to, to talk about which sections of the story go together. Because in the pre-writing, I think we're all pretty good at gathering ideas. We can help our students gather ideas. What we maybe aren't as practiced in is helping our students understand the organization of writing because writing is organized in different ways in different languages. So there are people that do a very linear, which is a, you know the US writing style, and there's a very flowery circuitous way of writing, which is more Arabic. So to, if you know that we have a very you know, step-by-step -step way of writing, it's important for us to communicate that to our learners, but it's also important for us to understand why our learners are writing the way they're writing and to honor that writing. So what I do is try to help the learners through highlighting to see what the organization is. Now there's another way that I, I do this and that's with masking to show, uh, and I, this actually wasn't supposed to show up here, but using a mentor task text and masking to highlight the organization of information. So this underneath this mask, it says Vietnam. So when I remember the moonlit nights of Vietnam, I can see the river like silver, I can hear the low hum of the cicadas, and I can smell the sweet aroma of the milkwood pine on the evening air. My memories of my home country are dear to me. Let me share them with you. So now I want to help my students use this same format to write. And if I'm online, it's quite easy because I, let's see if this is pink, that's a little bright. I mean, I hate pink, but come on. Okay, so I can see, I can hear, and I can smell. So the students could, having read this mentor text, now they can tell their story and it doesn't even have to be a moonlit night. Oops, let me move that back a little bit. You know, it could be some other kind of night. So this is what I, what I would want to do ideally with my students who were at the intermediate level is tell, tell me which words are specific to that author, to that writer which words could be for anybody and which words are special for that writer. And then we could mask them. Now, can you tell me the story uh, of what you remember of the nights of your home country? So this is a, a way of the highlighting shows the organization and the masking shows the structure. Any questions about that? I'm looking over here to see if I have any questions. Now, the one thing I'll tell you about masking with uh, using Zoom, obviously, is if, if you wanted to go to the next slide, all those masks go with you. So you have to delete them so that they don't, they don't follow you along. Also notice that I use a lot of images with my work with my students or when I'm demonstrating work. And that, you know, to make sure that the moonlit night is immediately clear. When I want to help learners identify the purpose of the mentor text and the, the task, I really have to ask them questions. What is the, what's the purpose of this email? That's the first thing I might ask. You know, what's the purpose of this story? Is it just telling a story? Is it narrative? Is it, oops, sorry for that missing uh, parenthesis. Is it meant to persuade? Is it meant to describe? Is it the author informing or is the author entertaining? because I want them to understand what the purpose of the writing is. Just the same way before they read, I want them to know what the purpose of the writer was in communicating to them so that they in turn, when they write, have a clear purpose. And then again, I also, when I'm doing pre-writing, I wanna talk about different elements of writing, compare and contrast or identify a process. So if I'm having my learners work on recipes, it's a great writing activity, right? We've all talked about 
you know, what's the value of, of food in health or what makes you feel comfort? You know, what food is your comfort food? And so that's a process writing activity when they write their recipe. And what happens if you leave out one step in the process? So we have to, to really bring that relevance into the writing for the student. And when they're looking at different types of writing, they can identify words that highlight the type of writing it is. So with compare and contrast, they're looking for those words in the white box. For cause and effect, they're looking for words in the gray box. For problem solution, they're working for looking at words in the brown box, I'm sorry, in the black box. So having students have that information is key to their being able to analyze. And it doesn't have to be that it's the whole list, right? Just because will help, or since will help, or um, however, you know, we can teach one word that's, that they can look for in the text. And this is all happening before they do a lot of their own writing. So that's why pre-writing can take some significant time. We can't just expect our learners to have this understanding. Native speakers don't necessarily have this understanding as those of you who are teaching ABE, ASE, GED, and HSE know. So these are tools that our learners deserve to have in their toolbox. Oh, I can tell what this author is doing. Now, if I want to do the same thing, I'm going to use the same trick. Now we come, of course, to the next stage of the writing process, which is drafting. And this is kind of a hands-off time for us. I mean, this is really, this is down to the student. They're sitting down with their paper, possibly with their phone. Oh my gosh, every time I think about that, uh, you know, they're sitting down maybe at a, a tablet or a laptop. But the writing is challenging. And so to help them, as I mentioned, to help them move from, well, let's talk about the strategies first. I meant, I thought it was going the other way. To help them move there, they're going to need certain strategies. So they may need to use different approaches. So it may be that for some students, just the act of writing, and we can think about our, our low level literacy students, the act of writing is beyond them at this point. It's not there yet, so they can record their, their draft. And then you can do with the tutor or within the class, somebody can listen and work with the student and they can write what it is they said, language experience. Um, it may be that for some students, typing is the better way for them to work. That's what they're used to. They've, they're, I should have said texting the draft, actually, because that's really what I was thinking of, that they would be, you know, texting their work. And maybe it would come in short, you know, uh, the short dialogue uh, balloons. And then for some students, and this is true of my daughter, all through middle school, I would hear uh, she would be upstairs pacing and talking out her paper before she wrote it. She would talk and then she would go quickly and write. So the, the, the thinking and walking process, think Thoreau, you know, is really connecting for some, for some writers. So being aware that it's not, there's not just one way to sit down and write. And certainly the understanding that if you sit down and that blank page is like an angry something staring back up at you, it's time to step away from that page. But we also want to be able to teach the strategy of identifying and eliminating distractions. And that's a great brainstorm, right? You know, what distracts you? Um, and to remind students, I don't know how many of you, you could give me a thumbs up. How many of you have ever noticed either your child or someone you care about, maybe your student, not using the tools that they just worked on for the week before? So they took notes but they don't look at the notes. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's it's a little mind boggling. And honestly, I'll tell you, it happens to me. I will sometimes say, wait a minute, I wrote about this. I can pull this back in. So this is a strategy to go back to what you prepared and bring that into your writing. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I wrote about this. I can, I can write, I just have to flesh it out. And then of course, the last one, positive self-talk. That's a very important strategy for the drafting stage and throughout writing. 
So could you put in the chat something you tell yourself to inspire yourself when you're feeling a little worried about writing? I'm waiting to see what our positive thought. Oh, there you go. You can always revise, write for an allotment of time, then have some coffee. It's only a draft. Shut up. <laughs> Just start writing. I can do this. Kathy, that's the one. It doesn't have to be perfect. Right. Um, Brene Brown says this all the time. You know, if it was perfect, it wouldn't happen. I have eat a jelly bean for each paragraph or page. Oh, Nancy. Yeah, that's, I would probably go with the dark chocolate, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's perfect, but I've, I've followed my process. What I wrote will serve the process I need it to. Good enough, a very important concept. Good enough. What's the, wh what am I writing for? What's my purpose? Don't sweat it. Jot down what you're thinking, and that's great. Playing music helps me to get through the process. And he said, for me, playing music is a distraction. I'm going to get right up and start dancing. But, right, for us, there is a, there's study music. So, just being aware of these strategies as part of the writing process, I think is really important for us because we have to be intentional. Can't just assume these strategies are strategies our learners have on hand. So to help them move from pre-writing to drafting, think about advising them to start at the end. What is it that they want the reader to learn or understand? Write their last sentence or their last paragraph and write backwards. Um, provide a sequence set of question prompts to help them do the writing, or a frame or sentence stems. Remind them to use their graphic organizer information. If they worked in a graphic organizer, make sure that they pull that out and that they can work from the model. Some students will feel like that's cheating, and we need to explain that all good writers start by writing from models and start by, you know, there's a difference between um, plagiarizing someone's work, but the, and we would have to make that clear, but the idea that they're using the structure to tell their story. And here's an example, just because sometimes the sequence questions something that I, I get questions about. So here's the topic from the uh, Florida Literacy Coalition essay book, the best advice I've ever received. And so I give the student these questions. What was your situation? Who did you talk to? Little parentheses, describe the person. How did this person respond to you? What advice did this person give you? How did this advice help you? So you can see that I'm sequencing what the student is going to write. Now, there are no transitions in here. So the students, on the, once the student has these drafted responses, then they're going to be able to go back in and put in transitions, which I'm probably going to be doing a, a lesson on. So before we go to the next, we've gotten through drafting, more or less. Um, before we go on, I would like to ask uh, for you to think about what the differences are between revising, editing, and proofreading. I just want you to take a moment and mentally identify what you feel those differences are. And then I'm going to show you my slide and you see if we agree. My research-based, evidence-based slide. <laughs> What's the difference? Okay, I'm going to show you now. So with revising, you're, it really means to look again, right? So it, it could be that you're using, uh, you're seeing it again through someone else's eyes. So that's what's helping you revise. It's making sure the message is getting across and to look at the way the ideas are organized and supported. That's what you're doing in re at the revising stage. So you would potentially rewrite portions of your draft, but you're rewriting towards getting that message clearer. In editing, you're ensuring that the wording is specific, descriptive, concise, and accurate. And that's where the grammar and vocabulary comes in. So the message can get across. We know this. As 85% as of us know, working with English language learners, 
we can understand a lot that is grammatically incorrect. Maybe our colleagues who are not English language instructors can't do it as easily, but we, we can make sense and our learners can make themselves understood. What we want in editing is to make sure that the speaker who doesn't have all of the tolerance for ambiguity that we have developed is able to really get the point of that story because the wording is specific, descriptive, concise, and accurate. And then with proofreading, that's when we're going back in. We're making sure that the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. We're looking at the mechanics. So we could do editing and proofreading together. That's something that, you know, as, as writers, we, we tend to. But for the English language learner, sometimes it's good to split those two apart because there's an awful lot to do if you're talking about doing spelling and punctuation and typos and fragments. You wanna make sure, again, that you're very specific on what you're editing for. And if you're doing uh, something that's gonna get published in an essay book, the chances are you're gonna to wanna to do all the elements of that editing. But for the majority of work that you do with your learners, even if they're putting something in a newsletter for the school or they're writing a letter to their assembly person, in that case, you want to you want to work on the editing for the purpose of the writing. So in some cases, certain grammatical errors aren't going to be an issue. Certain uh, specificity of vocabulary won't be an issue, but you have to decide what are you focusing on with that learner. So within the revising and feedback process, we want to have another set of eyes. Maybe it's maybe it's yours as the tutor. Maybe it's the classmates in a classroom setting. Maybe it's just the the author, the learner author's family member or cousin. And I see that Neil is writing proofreading is the least important because most of our students' writing won't be published professionally, and many tutors might not have strong orthographic, grammatic, or, or spelling skills. That's right. But with the writing process, we do want that sense of publishing. That's an important element that the learner's voice is being heard beyond just between the tutor and the learner. So whether it's in a library newsletter, so I agree, but some element of proofreading is good for the student to do. So let's look at the strategies here. Again, positive self-talk, noticing. We know that noticing is really, really, really a big deal across the board in all language learning. We want them to notice what is happening in their writing. We want them to be able to request help. We want them to do active listening. So if Jordan is talking to me and she's giving me feedback on my paper, I need to really listen to her. I need to really understand what she's saying. So I have to repeat information back. I have to clarify. This is where we're really building in, along with the strategy of good writing, or the, the strategies that bring about good writing, we're also pulling in other language skills. And having the learner take notes on the feedback. Now we can help with that by having checklists. And then again, that re re uh, referencing the notes while revising. So here are some feedback checklists really quickly. Um, for, you know, what, let's say that you do a language experience story with one learner, you're a tutor and you do a language experience story with one learner and you want to, uh, tell the learner how the story made you feel. You can model this, or you in fact can do what I suggested, which is have another tutor and learner pair read the story and then give this back to the learner. The important thing is that the learner gets some information about the message that, that he or she or they put across. Now here's a more... Um, to say a more robust checklist let's put it that way so this is if you're in a classroom setting you know you want to make sure that learners understand they need to be kind they need to be specific and they need to be helpful those are the three things that we as teachers tutors and people offering feedback have to keep in the front of our minds 
you know, we're, we're, we're not there to red pen everything out. We're really there to support the writer. And those of you that write professionally would probably wish that your editors would do this. <laughs> okay. And then if you're going to have peer feedback, put some writing up that's yours and have the class do the feedback with you so that they get a chance to see how it's done, but using your own writing or some other writing, but not writing from the class. And then you can start having the students pair up and do this type of checklist with their uh, classmate. I particularly love this, and I think it's another writing opportunity. So let's say that we're working asynchronously, virtually, and we have, you know, six, seven stories or um, maybe a paragraphs, uh, and students are taking these paragraphs and reading them and giving feedback. If we give them this sort of a frame and we have them write each other, thank you for letting me read your, etc. I thought this was great. And then quote from that. And that's a great academic skill. Uh, and when I read X, I thought Y, etc. And then I suggest, and then we're giving them exactly what we want them to say specifically, moving, deleting, or changing this. So, and offering for offering to help. So I think that by creating this more communicative opportunity for, for both partners to write to each other, we're continuing that writing process. Now the teacher is also engaged in feedback, especially if you're tutoring. And one of the things you might wanna do for yourself is create a one point rubric. And the difference between a one point rubric and an analytic rubric is that there are not all these, this, this big scale. There is a set of criteria. There are dimensions, the content, the organization, the clarity, the evidence, which I have over here. Let me just make sure that you can see what I'm speaking about. So here we have the dimensions and here we have the criteria. And all we're checking is whether the student has met the criteria. There should be actually another thing right here for the check to go in, if they've met the criteria. And then if there's something we want to call out and we want to say, wow, you know, you, you really, bravo, you really hit this. Or hmm, maybe better work a little on this. That, that's a way for us to handle our feedback that's a little more contained than writing all over the paper. It's also good for us because we're trying to then um, bring into focus, what is this writing meant to do? What are we really focused on with the students? So in some cases, this rubric would look very different. There's, we're not asking for details or facts to support a main idea. It's a narrative. So we wanna know, is there a good opening sentence? You know, so we would change this based on what it was we wanted the, the writing to convey. So here's what I did with this one. Oh, it was very interesting. But over here, hmm, I thought sentences three and five looked to be exactly the same to me. Um, and then we better look at the conclusion. And oh, you did good research. So again, this is something that would apply to a specific kind of writing, but I, if the student were telling a story, I might have a very different rubric. Now we come to editing, looking at issues with grammar, word choice, and punctuation. So again, reading closely, using reference tools. Now this is a big, big difference now that we've gone so digital. Students have so many tools available to them. Grammarly is beginning to drive me crazy because it comes up and it tells me these things. It's like, no, that is a word. But otherwise, it's quite helpful. You know, it definitely, If and I'm the, I just use the free version. I know if you use the paid version, it will tell you how to make things much more direct. But again, very English American style of writing where they just want everything to be quite bulleted and, and short. Um, using grammar and spell checkers, reading your work aloud. This is a big thing for students to do. Now, 
We say this a lot, but think about the English language learner reading aloud. It may not make a difference because the learner doesn't have the cadence of English in his or her or their ears. So reading aloud is good, I think, to, to be able to check and say, do you, you know, do you stop for a period? You know, it's it's good to be able to highlight that, that maybe they'll see that it's running on. But I don't rely heavily on reading aloud for learners who are they have very limited English proficiency. Using checklists, I do rely on because that's something that the learner can go back and forth at any level and see, do I have this? Yes, I do. No, I don't. And then this last strategy of seeking help. You know, don't, learners need not to be drowning in frustration and they need, they need the support that we can give them, but they also need to know how to ask for help. So if they are working virtually, they need to be able to write you through the learning management system or ask you in the, in the virtual class through the chat, possibly direct message you, I'm having trouble with my vocabulary or I'm having trouble with this sentence. Here's a checklist. It's from Read, Write, Think. I like it. And I, but there are many, many, many checklists. I'm, oh my goodness, Pinterest has a billion checklists. So the checklist should apply to what it, the writing task was. I just picked this to show you an example. I love the online dictionaries because they give all kinds of support. Um, and they also, you've got thesaurus.com when you're working on word specificity, but of course you want to help students with that because, you know, uh, welcome is not going to work in the same way as acceptable. You know, you can say this was acceptable, this was welcome, but not in all settings. So learners don't necessarily know the, they won't know, especially uh, English language learners won't know the subtleties, the nuances of the words. So they may choose a word that doesn't quite work and then you wanna teach them to go look that word up. So it's a process. And Naomi is saying that she's been using the free version of No Red Ink for writing practice. It's designed for classes, not one-on-one, -on -one. thanks. That's the best thing is working together and getting our being able to collaborate with each other and share our ideas. And Todd is saying he's always had students develop their own checklist based on errors they made the most. That's a great idea, Todd, because one of the big issues in correcting, as I'm sure you're aware, is that teachers and tutors often make all the corrections for the learners, or they do the good thing of correcting the first paragraph and then saying, find the errors, but the learner still hasn't noticed them because the teacher is the one that's that's highlighted it. So we have to provide this kind of, uh, this is great, uh, great work for students to do their own agency building checklists. So again, having them use self-editing ch checklists before you give them feedback gives them a chance to have their own agency about their work. And then you can supply the feedback focusing on one paragraph, as I mentioned, and then having them correct similar errors. Okay, your students aren't writing more than a paragraph, correct one sentence and have them look for similar errors. Focus on one type of error at a time. This is so, so important. Now, if it's an essay, that's gonna be harder to do, but certainly in a paragraph or in a group of sentences, you help learners focus on one concept at a time so they can look at it and then you can come back to it and do the next concept. And please lose the red ink. You need something that shows up that the learner can see. I like highlighting. I like commenting on the side is great if you've got, you know, if the students are working online, but red just has so many, I don't want to say trauma inducing, but definitely it's a trigger for a lot of people. Um, it certainly is for me. I used to get my French papers back marked every which way, you know, and it would always be, I can't even remember what the word was in French, but it was like ideas, A minus, form C plus, you know, and, and the form C plus was so clear because the whole paper was read. At least she understood that there was some thought there. 
Okay, so these are the strategies we we I mentioned today. Yeah, Beth is saying that red has big meaning and overwhelms. I'm going to ask you to go into your breakout rooms again. We're going to be a little smaller this time in the breakout rooms. And, and this time, what I'd like you to do is comment on one thing that you saw or heard that is something that either you want to make use of or you'd like to learn more about or that you have a question about. Okay, and I'm going to keep these up here as the strategies that are important for this just for a few minutes. You're going to have five minutes. Blue is a cooler color, Neil, but I would say that the problem with blue is that it very often next to black isn't as visible. So I know a lot of people use green and purple. Those the, uh, Green seems to it has the, the concept of spring and growth and growth mindset. And, you know, so just think about that. But blue is definitely uh, a cooler. It's cooler. <laughs> okay, so what you're doing, five minutes in your breakout groups, possibly new people because you're going to be random. And the goal is for you to have a chance to process a little bit of all this talking I've just done. <laughs> so I'd like you to think about one thing you've heard, one thing you saw, that you're going to take back with you or that you want to learn more about or that you have a question about. Five minutes on the clock. Let's go. All right, uh, Jamie, so we're doing about three to four people per room? Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll admit Robert. Okay. Although Robert won't know what the heck's going on. Be kind to Robert, whoever has him in his <laughs> Okay, so it's a uh, it's we're doing five minutes and uh, we're gonna make four minutes. Remember, four minutes and then four one. minutes. Yep, four minutes and then um, a countdown timer of um, one minute. All right. Okay. All right. Everyone should be able to join their rooms now. Okay. Hi, Robert. We're doing. Um, we're doing breakout rooms. Oh, he's already here. Robert keeps getting kicked out. I think. I know. Let me see if I can figure it out. Joanne, are you are you able to get into your room? I'm going to pause the recording. Robert, are you in? It seems like you keep getting booted out. Nope, he's gone. 